Alrighty, so uh, this is our first lecture for quantum mechanics. Uh, this topic is a very, very interesting topic. Uh, it's actually the reason I got into physics, um, or at least when I had to change my original major from medicine. It's the reason I chose physics over everything else. Uh, what's interesting about it is that everything we think we know, or at least we thought we knew in the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, seems to be wrong. Uh, everything physics told us, everything we thought we understood about the universe was completely incorrect. Uh, even though all of those theories at the time predicted very well almost every observation we can think of. That is to say, uh, with uh, normal classical mechanics, we could send rockets to the moon, we could uh, shoot a cannonball and uh, hit our target, shoot a bow and arrow, we could predict a lot of the orbits. There were some problems with some of the orbital calculations, but they had more to do with relativity, which was found out later. But pretty much everything we thought we understood about how the world works and how f the rules and laws of physics in the very early 1900s uh, worked very well for us. Um, however, as people began to think more and more uh, and delve into those theories, some problems started to arise. And quantum mechanics was invented essentially to fix those issues, but in doing so, quantum mechanics completely rewrote how we think about the universe. And it rewrote it very, very fundamentally. And in a way, it's very strange to think about uh, which you will learn over the course of this semester, that you could go your whole life knowing nothing about quantum mechanics and be able to do perfectly well. You could do perfectly well as a physicist, as an engineer. In fact, very few engineers know anything about quantum mechanics and are the ones building bridges and buildings and sewer systems and all sorts of stuff. And they all work perfectly fine. Yet, the fundamental laws of physics, of the universe themselves, tell us that our classical way of thinking is exactly wrong. And that's what makes this so interesting. That there is this aspect to the universe that, is, that works different than we think it does. So, one of the problems with physics most people have is that it starts to get a little boring. You have these mundane topics sometimes, especially classical mechanics, shoot a cannonball or you drop a, a, a sphere from the a cliff and you want to figure out how long it'll take to hit the ground. Those things are kind of boring. They're nice in that you could figure them out and you could calculate the correct answer, but there's nothing exciting about it. Quantum mechanics will show us, however, that there are very, very exciting aspects to the world. For instance, things like teleportation, where you can have an object existing somewhere, seemingly, or at least we could measure that it exists somewhere. We could find it, detect it in a certain location, and then after we wait a few uh, uh, periods of time, all of a sudden that object is located somewhere else. And if we try to track how it got from its original location to its final location, we fail. So in essence, it's as if it disappears from its current spot and reappears somewhere else. And this is normal. This happens all the time. And a lot of everything we use in today's Electronics and technology uh, relies on the fact that this kind of thing happens. The fact that you can have an object placed in an area where it's forced to be, 
with seemingly no way of escaping. And you wait a little bit of time and all of a sudden it escapes. Somehow it, it just leaves this prison and finds its way outside with no rational reasoning to describe how it could have happened. For instance, if you think about, uh, let's say you have a bowl and you place a, a, I don't know, a cherry in the bottom of the bowl. Well, obviously, the cherry's just going to sit there at the bottom of the bowl. The only way for the cherry to leave the bowl is for you to pick it out, so you literally lift it out, or you can flick it and hit it hard enough for the cherry to roll up over the edge and, and get out of the bowl. But there's not enough energy for that cherry to leave on its own. It's just going to sit there forever and ever and ever, and you'll never find it leave. Yet, in certain cases, you'll have an object placed in a box where the walls of the box are too high for this object to leave. The only way it could leave is if you gave it enough energy for it to get over the walls. But even if you don't give it that energy, if you wait long enough, and it's not a very long time to have to wait, it's a short time to wait, that object will leave the walls without going over the walls. It's, it's as if it passes straight through solid walls, and you'll find the object outside of that barrier. These are the things that actually happen in this universe. They happen all the time. It's not fake. It's Scientists have seen it. They've detected it, and what's most interesting is that of all the theories of physics we have, relativity, classical mechanics, anything you could think of, the best, most perfect predictor we have is quantum mechanics. It is the most successful theory we have devised thus far. Now, the issue comes in the fact that we can only predict so much. Prediction with quantum mechanics fails pretty miserably if what you want to do is what's called determinism. Determinism is an aspect where you can figure out exactly where something's going to be or exactly how fast it's going to be moving at a certain period of time. Given enough information, you could use some equations and tell me the perfect exact answer. So, for instance, as you've done in previous physics classes, if I tell you, you throw a ball off a cliff, here's a cliff, 20 meters high, throw a ball horizontally with a velocity of 10 meters per second, and I say gravity has an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second down, I can ask the question, how far from the edge of the cliff will this ball land on the ground? And you can tell me the exact answer. And of course, we can make some approximations. We could say, assume there's no air resistance, assume there's no friction. But then we could go further, we could be even better physicists and allow for air resistance and get better answers. But that's determinism. If you give me enough of this information to begin with, like what's the original height of the cliff, what's the exact speed of the ball, how much gravity is there, then I can tell you with my calculations exactly where to paint a bullseye on the ground for that ball to land. Well, quantum mechanics doesn't allow for this. It's not deterministic, it's actually probabilistic. Probable hmm, stick. And what that means is I can't give you the exact answer to a question you may give me, but I can give you the probability that these things will happen. So for instance, you may say, uh, here's some area and there's a particle sitting here, and it currently has uh, some amount of energy. Well, I can tell you the probability that you'll find the particle here within this space. 
after, you know, t equals three seconds. I can't determine that it'll definitely be there, but I could say, oh, there's a 75% chance it'll be there. And so that means there's a 25% chance it'll be somewhere else. So I could give you probabilities. I can say it's likely that this will happen. And in fact, if you do a million billion experiments, then 75% of the time you will get this answer and 25% of the time you'll get this other answer. And you'll be perfectly correct with your probabilities. But what I can't do with quantum mechanics is say, with 100% certainty, you will find the ball in this particular spot. Okay, so that's the issue with quantum mechanics. It's the best predicting theory we have. However, it can only predict probabilities and not exact answers. It's not deterministic. Now, why was quantum mechanics invented? Uh, this is a very interesting story, and there's a lot of information about that, the, the history of quantum mechanics. And what's nice is it, it deals with some of the biggest, smartest, most famous physicists to ever live. They all happen to be around at the same time, and they all happen to contribute to quantum mechanics, like Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, um, Dirac, Schrodinger. Oppenheimer, all these people, and more, a lot more, uh, help give rise to this theory of quantum mechanics. And this was all in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. And as time progressed, we got better and better versions of the theory. But why did they invent this theory? Why uh, did they kind of release their grip on classical mechanics and accept the fact that quantum mechanics had to be true. Well, what I want to do is a little thought experiment that shows why we must allow for quantum mechanics, or at least a different theory that classical mechanics cannot uh, give us. So, Let's go over this particular experiment. Let's say we have an electron. Uh, it doesn't have to be an electron. It could be some particle. But I'll just call it an electron for now. And allow this electron to have two characteristics. First characteristic is color, whereby it could be either black or white. So every single time you see... Now, this isn't true. This is a thought experiment. This is just to make you understand the logic. Uh, don't actually think this is true about electrons. But let's say there is this particular characteristic about electrons that we call color. And what that means is every time we measure this characteristic, you either get the answer that the electron is black or that it's white. Okay, what do we mean by the fact that it has this characteristic? What it means is this, take an electron, some random electron. We send this electron into some box. This box is the machine that measures the color. So we'll call it the color machine. And what this machine does is it takes in an electron and it sends it out from one of two paths. This path here is the black path. This path here is the white path. So what it does is it takes in an electron. It measures this characteristic called color. And then if it's white, it sends it off to the right. And if it's black, it sends it up to the top. So what that means is any random electron you get, half of them 50% of the time, they'll come out the white side, and 50% of the time, they'll come out the black side. So, half electrons are black, half electrons are white. Okay? Now, you can ask this machine, how does it actually determine the color? Don't ask that question. I will say right here that any machine you build, let's say 
we have these very good engineers that are building these machines for us. Ten different engineers have built color machines, and each one does it a different way. Some of them use, you know, little microscopes that can look at the electrons. Some of them use magnets. Some of them use electric fields. Some of them use uh, air resistors. I don't know. All sorts of different ways of determining. And no matter which machine we use, if it's a color determining machine, we always get the same answer. So the way it measures the color makes no difference to what we're going to discuss. The fact is, all electrons have this characteristic, which we'll call color. Half of them are black, half of them are white. And when we say they have color, what that means is, if we take a random electron and we feed it into the color machine, every single time an electron comes out of the color machine, let's say it comes out of the white side, if we put it into another color machine, then every single one that comes out will always match. So that is to say, we start with a random electron, we feed it into the first color machine. Let's just say it comes out white. So here comes the electron coming out of the white side, and we feed it directly into a second machine that measures color. Every single time a white electron comes in, it always comes out the white side. Okay? So that's what it means for the electron to have color. Another way of saying it is that it's persistent. That is to say, if you measure the color, then it will always have that color. So if you have a random electron, you don't know its color. If you measure it to be black, the next time you measure it to be black, it'll still be black. It'll never change to white. If you go from one color machine to the next, it will always have the same color. Thus, we say it has this characteristic of color. The other characteristic we're going to allow for is called heat, let's say. And we'll go with spiciness, <laughs> kind of heat. Not heat energy like uh, calorimetry or thermodynamics. And for heat, something can either be spicy or it could be mild. Now, I'm making these choices of color and heat because I don't want to use real terms of electrons to confuse things. These are obviously nonsensical characteristics. You're not going to stick an electron in your mouth and find it to be spicy. I'm just naming characteristics, random names, but it's characteristics nonetheless. And maybe they mean things like spin or other or charge or whatever. For our experiment, we're going to call them color, and we're going to call them heat. And so same thing as with color. If we take a random electron, we feed it into a heat machine. Well, they could either be mild or they could be spicy. And of course, 50% of the time, they'll be spicy. 50% of the time, they'll be mild. And of course, like color, heat is also persistent. So that is to say... If we take a random electron, we feed it into a heat box. If, let's say, it happens to come out of the spicy side, and we feed it into another heat box, then 100% of the time, it'll always come out of the spicy side, and none will come out of the mild side. So if it was measured to be spicy, if you measure it again, It'll still be spicy. Okay? So both color is persistent and heat is persistent. So we now accept the fact that electrons have these two certain characteristics. And we have some way of measuring the characteristics. How, what is the actual details? Uh, you know, how do the microscopes work to look at the spiciness? I don't know. And it doesn't matter. This is purely thought uh, uh, experiments. Now, what we're going to do over the course of this video and the next is start to do more extravagant experiments to see what happens. 
So one thing we may want to do is try to figure out um, is color correlated to heat or vice versa. And what this means is if I have a white electron, is that electron more likely to be spicy or more likely to be mild or does the color of the electron have nothing to do with the heat and vice versa. If I have a spicy electron, is that more likely to be black or is it more likely to be white or does it have no dependence on the color whatsoever? So we have different options here and we want to find out is color and heat related in some way. It might be that all white electrons are mild or maybe 20% of the time they'll be mild, but 80% will be spicy. So if you happen to know the color, you know more likely it's going to be one or the other. Well, here's one experiment we're going to try to do. Let's take a random electron. So here's my random electron. And I'm going to feed it into a color machine. So we already know what can happen. That electron can either come out and be white, or it can be black. And in fact, half the time it'll be white, half the time it'll be black. Let's say that it happens to be white, and it comes out the white side. So what we're going to do now is we're going to feed that electron into the heat machine. And now we know one of two things is going to happen, likely, I think. This electron that we now know is white is going to be fed into the heat machine. We want to see, is it going to be white or is it, I mean mild, or is it going to be spicy? So if we do this a million times, what do we get? We happen to get the fact that 50% of the time it's mild and 50% of the time it's spicy. So what does this tell me? This tells me that white electrons, there's no relation between the whiteness and the heat. So if you get a white electron, it's 50-50 of what kind of heat it has. And the same is true for black electrons. If we take the black electron out of the color machine and we measure its heat, again, 50% of the time we measure it, we get mild, and 50% of the time we get spicy. So what does this tell me? This tells me if I know the color, that tells me nothing about the heat. If I happen to know it's white, I know nothing. It's either white or black, 50-50, flip a coin. I mean, mild or spicy. If I happen to know it's a black electron, Again, 50-50, whether it's mild or spicy. And if I do this experiment the opposite way, if I start with the heat machine, and I take the mild electron, and I feed it into a color machine, then 50% of the time I get white, and 50% of the time I get black, and same goes for spicy. Same exact thing. So, what information do we take from the, the, uh, this experiment, the results of this experiment? What this should tell you is that the color is not correlated to the heat in any way. It's not weighted correlation, so that is to say, well, blacks are more likely to be spicy than mild, but you could still get either one. If that were true, then this would be something, you know, like 75% and 25%. But we don't get that. We get 50-50. And same for mild. If I have a mild electron, it's 50-50 whether it's black or white. They're not related in any way. If I know information about the color, it tells me nothing about the heat. If I know something about the heat, it tells me nothing about the color. They're not related. They don't correlate with each other in any way. 
Okay, well, that's a good thing to know. It's kind of like uh, you have a human being, they have blue eyes, are they tall or short? Well, you have no idea. Or do they have long hair or short hair? You have no idea. That's not correlated. The color of eyes and the height of the person are two independent characteristics. They happen to have these two characteristics, but the fact that they have some color of eyes tells you nothing about the height. Okay. Well, here's another experiment I may want to try. What if we were to do this? Let's take a random electron and I feed it into a color box. And let's say it happens to be white. So that electron continues to go out of the white side and it goes into the heat box. Okay, well one thing we already know is that it's 50-50 whether it'll be mild or spicy. That's the, what this past experiment told us. If I start with a white electron, I feed it into a heat uh, box. Half of them are mild, half of them are spicy. Same thing here. Here I have a white electron, I put it into a heat box. Half are mild, half are spicy. Let's just say with this particular experiment, it happened to be mild. So now what do I know? From this, I know it's white. And from this, I know it's mild. I now put the electron back into a third box, which measures color. What do I expect to see? This is your chance to do a prediction, and this is what physicists do. We now have a lot of information. We look at the, what our past results say. We look at all the uh, seeming laws that we understand and we predict what we will find if this thing occurs. And so, forgetting all about, you know, the difference between quantum and classical and all of this stuff, just use your normal classical brain, and you say, okay, well, this is what I know. I know my electron was measured to be white. Okay, measured to be white. And, I know that it's persistent, which says, if I measure it to be white, and I go to measure the color of another time, it will always be measured to be white. It will never change to black. The only way an electron can be measured to be black is if it's measured to be black the first time. And the only way something can be measured to be white is if it's measured to be white the first time. We've never seen in any experiment you feed an electron in, it happens to be black. You feed it back into another color machine, and all of a sudden now it's white. It's never happened. When you feed it in, it comes out the black side. You feed it into another machine, it comes out the black side again every time. Okay. But we then fed it into a heat machine. Well, you could say, well, maybe the heat machine could affect it. Well, here's the problem. This last experiment told us that the color and the heat has nothing to do with each other. Right? Knowing the color makes no difference to the heat. And knowing the heat makes no difference to the color. They're not related. They're two independent characteristics. So, what do I know? I measured the electron to be mild. And mild is persistent. Thus, my electron is a mild white electron. Right? Put the electron into the color. It's white. I now know it's white. I then plugged it into a heat machine. It came out the mild side. I now know it's mild. So I now have an electron that's white and mild. I take that electron, I put it into my color machine. My prediction every time this happens, 100% of the time, it'll be white. 
That just makes sense. That's logic. I measured it to be white. I know color is persistent. I measured it with the heat thing, but heat and color don't mix. I happened to find it was mild. I now think if I measure the color again, it's going to be white. What do I get? 50% white, 50% black. And now we see one example of where classical mechanics fails us. The logic that we use with classical mechanics does not work. Somehow, this object has two characteristics, one being color, one being heat. We've done all the experiments in the world to verify, number one, that if you measure the color, it will always have that color. And number two, if you uh, try to measure the color, it doesn't affect the heat, or you don't know what the heat is. And if you measure the heat, you don't know what the color is. So they're not related. They're not correlated in any way. They're independent characteristics. However, we see an example where even with that being true, and it is true, I'm not lying to you, even with those things being true, I have an example of an electron measured to be white, then measured to be mild, losing its color because you measured its heat, even though heat and color don't mix. Heat and color are not correlated in any way. So, this is something we're going to have to face and figure out. And in fact, we're going to explore it more. We're going to get into deeper experiments, more complex, and see if this strange occurrence, this phenomenon, gives rise to even more weirdness later on. For instance, what happens if I put a color and a heat, and then a color again, and then another color, what will happen? Or a color, a heat, a color, and a heat. And all sorts of different combinations we're going to see. Can we make predictions? If we can, that's a good thing. That's what physicists want. If we cannot, then we need to figure out why we're thinking incorrectly and how to think about things better. Because if we cannot resolve this issue then the job of a physicist is made impossible. And we can't have that. So, next video, we're going to continue with these thought experiments, going into more complicated ones, but we'll still be able to follow them. I'm going to do my best to try to explain the logic. And we're going to see some very, very weird things happen that you cannot explain under normal physical laws. We must have some new theory that allows us to describe the fact that our logic doesn't work compared to the way the universe works. We think we know how things work. We think we know how things are related. But deep down at the fundamental level, we're completely wrong. And we're still to this day trying desperately to figure out the philosophy behind it and how these things actually work. One thing that's kind of depressing is that while we have our theory of quantum mechanics and we can make great predictions, we cannot say how it happens. So, as I said towards the beginning, you can have an electron trapped in a box with high walls and we know there's no way this electron can escape the box. However, we know it does escape the box with some probability. And I could tell you exactly what the probability is, how long you'd need to wait for it to occur, and it's a perfect prediction. But what I cannot tell you, at least to this date, is how did the electron actually do it? I can't show you the route that the electron took on its way from inside the box to outside the box. I can't tell you the physical mechanism 
behind how the electron traveled through the walls and got to the outside of the box. These things we don't know, we have no idea how it works. All we know is that it does work, and we can predict how it works, at least to probabilities, to very good probabilities, uh, perfectly. As good as any physical theory we've ever had. So it's kind of depressing, but it also it's exciting because that means we haven't figured everything out yet. There's room for us to discover. There's room for someone young, usually. Uh, people in their 40s and 50s are not the big physicists. It's 20s and 30s that make these discoveries. There's room for new people to come in and say, aha, uh -huh, this is what everybody is missing. This is how things happen. Discoveries will continue to be made in this field. And so that's the exciting part of quantum mechanics as well. Learning how different and how unusual the true laws of physics really are compared to how we think they are, as well as the fact that there's so much undiscovered waiting for us to figure out in the future. So, that's all I have for this particular video. Next time, as I said, we'll continue with these little experiments and eventually get into some of the meat of quantum mechanics, which is where a lot of the math lies. So, we'll get to that soon enough. Until next time.